This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. A Hollywood camera crew flies over a live volcano. When, without warning, the engine fails and the chopper plummets into the cauldron below. The crew survives only to find themselves yards away from molten lava, surrounded in a fog of poisonous gases. Rescue attempts are frustrated by bad weather, zero visibility, and lethal fumes. Each man makes his own escape attempt, fighting off fears that the others are dead. But are they? What it takes to survive in an inferno on I Shouldn't Be Alive. The Big Island of Hawaii is one of the most diverse places on Earth. It's home to exquisite beaches, dramatic waterfalls, and dense tropical jungles. It is also home to Kilauea, one of the world's most active volcanoes. Cameraman Mike Benson is here to shoot the Pu'u'o'o vent of Kilauea for a Hollywood movie. I love doing aerial photography. It's a real passion of mine. I love to fly. Every time I get in a helicopter, I'm always excited about doing it. Uh, I just I just love everything there is about it. Mike's persuaded his assistant, Chris Duddy, to come along for the ride. I was Mike's camera assistant. So my job was to, you know, mount the camera, prepare the camera for filming. Chris and I had worked on three or four pictures. He had never really flown much in a helicopter, and it was kind of my doing to have him fly with us. Flying the chopper is Craig Hosking, who's one of the most experienced pilots around. At 16, Craig became the world's youngest qualified helicopter pilot. I fly airplanes and helicopters doing camera work and uh, stunt work in the film business. Michael's helping me line up the shot. I'm helping him with what I see. It's a real synergy that works between me and the camera. Roger that. There was one moment we're flying along the coast and there's actually a lava shooting into the ocean and there was this great white plume coming up. Molten lava spews up within the volcano and flows through underground tubes towards the sea. There it solidifies, creating more landmass in a constantly changing display of nature's awesome power. The crew flies towards the volcano with the goal of shooting some footage that will simulate a helicopter dropping directly into the crater. Local superstition has it that the volcano is home to the most powerful of all the Hawaiian gods, Madame Pele. And legend dictates that you pay homage to the fire goddess by dropping a bottle of gin into the volcano, ensuring that no harm will come to you. Chris had the bottle, Ow! and he did kind of a, a wussy throw. You totally missed! How could you do that? <laughs> it's like hitting the Pacific Ocean. I mean, it's huge. He thinks it's funny. I don't really find it that funny. but. <laughs> so my comment was, well, that's OK. She'll get the idea. Despite failing to appease the goddess, Mike, Chris, and Craig go for a take. Okay, Craig, let's uh, line up for the crater. Craig lowers the helicopter as they skim towards the edge of the crater. And rolling. Even a couple hundred feet up in the helicopter, you can feel the heat coming up off of it. It's incredible. As we arrived near the edge of the crater, we would tilt the camera down and zoom to create the look down, the drop down into the crater. And cut. Okay, Craig, take it down and uh, we'll review that. Let's have a look. 
Wanting to make sure he's got the shot, Mike asks Craig to put the chopper down so that he can review the footage. I noticed that the length of film was real short. It was only like three or four seconds. That's not quite there. You want to see it again? Yeah, sure. I mean, I thought it was a good take, but obviously when you're making a movie, we do a second or third take in case there's any problems with any of the other takes. It's the ego that we all have to make the perfect shot, put something on film that nobody else has done before. Now, let's go try another one. The decision is made. Mike, Chris, and Craig head back to the volcano to go for another take. You feel that when you're filming that nothing's going to happen, that you're encased in this piece of metal of a helicopter. I get more concerned about the traffic in L.A. than I do about the traffic in the sky. Okay, Craig, for this next uh, pass, I want to try and take it a little lower and a little faster, if that's all right. Roger that. We weren't doing stunt flying. It wasn't uh, any acrobatic aerial work. It was pretty straightforward flying. And rolling. It might have seemed straightforward, but as the chopper passes over the crater rim, it experiences catastrophic engine failure. The first thing you hear and feel is the RPM decreasing. Usually in an engine failure, you have a quick deceleration. This, it was just kind of slowly spooling down. What's happening? There's a sound that beeps. Never forget that. The beep, 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 beep. At that point, we're in kind of a whiteout where the, the plume comes up out of the cone. Oh, man, no way. And then the next thing he said was, uh, we're going down. And that's something you don't want to hear a pilot say ever. Sierra Hotel, engine failure, going down in the mist. Hang on! You get about a second or two of recognition, and then you go right into the emergency procedures. Knowing he's about to crash, Craig initiates auto-rotation. He disconnects the rotor blades from the dying engine's gearbox so that they can keep turning freely. As the helicopter drops, air force through the blades slows their descent and allows Craig to retain some control of his aircraft. I've done hundreds, maybe even the thousands of auto rotations in training. What made this one challenging was uh, the choices I had to make about where to land. Auto rotation is a controlled crash. I was just thinking, are we gonna die? And then all of a sudden we lost the main rotor and then you're just kind of falling like a rock. Miraculously, Mike, Chris and Craig survived the crash. But this is just the start of their problems they've landed deep inside one of the world's most active volcanoes. I wasn't even really sure where we were. I didn't realize we were inside the crater. You okay, Mike? <coughs> You're bleeding! What? You're bleeding! I'll get the first aid kit. Fortunately, we missed a steam crater by a couple of hundred yards, and we missed a lava pool so of all the places in the volcano, it was probably the safest place, if you can call it the bottom of a volcano a safe place. In an active volcano, there is no safe place. The crew is on the crater floor in a thick cloud of fog, a poisonous mix of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and hydrogen chloride. It's a deadly combination, and they're breathing it in. <laughs> Mike Benson, Chris Duddy, and Craig Hosking have crashed into one of the world's most active volcanoes. Having miraculously survived, they are now suffocating in poisonous sulfuric fumes. It had this terrible taste, and when you had to take a breath, your lungs would burn. We're thinking that we've got to get out of here because we're going to have a difficult time in trying to get any fresh oxygen. 
Although they've crash-landed onto the hard crater floor, just beneath them is a cauldron of molten lava trying to break through from a huge magma chamber half a mile beneath the surface. We were probably about 50 yards from the existing lava pool. It's almost like a river flow sound. And it was hot on our feet. You hear it bubbling and gurgling and spitting. When we realize when we're looking up, we're inside this crater. Oh my God, we gotta get out of here. The helicopter's electrical system has been destroyed in the crash. With no radio to call for help, climbing out is their only chance of survival. All three of us were in excellent physical condition. We thought that we could scale out the 300 feet and make it to the top to get back to safety. It sounds like a good idea, but the inside of a volcano is shaped like a bowl. The higher up you go, the steeper it gets. The first 100 feet or so were pretty easy. After that, it became deadly treacherous. Ah! If you've ever picked up a volcanic rock and they're just sharp like needles, as you pull up on it, it starts to crumble and break away. As we're doing this, you're hot and you're sweaty from expelling all this energy. Well, it was two steps forward and sometimes three back. After a while, Chris manages to claw his way ahead of Mike and Craig, but he's now on a near vertical cliff face. There was a few times where I was grabbing, clawing at rocks, and I would knock some debris down. I just realized that I got to a point where it was so sheer and dangerous that I could easily grab onto something that gave way and I would fall. Don't come this way! I'm stuck! It was kind of like when you're a kid and you're climbing a tree. And you get up and you can't go down, you can't go up, and so you just kind of hang on. <coughs> Mike and Craig are 50 feet below Chris. They lose him in the smoke. Chris! Where are you? What? I can't hear you! Craig and I are standing on this little ledge. It's probably about three feet long and maybe 18 inches wide. The air was better, and that's where we could really sit down and digest what had just happened and come up with a plan. Climbing out isn't working. Their only chance is getting power back into the radio. Craig volunteers to make the treacherous journey back down to the crash site. Okay. I knew how the helicopter electrical system worked. There was no need for all three of us to go back down into the potentially deadly gases. <coughs> Mike and I have got a little pocket of cleaner air than on the bottom. And when he went back down, he really was risking a lot. It's a long shot that Craig can get the radio to work. But in desperation, he starts the climb down into the dense, poisonous smoke. He disappears from Mike and Chris's view. The bottom of the crater peril was, was horrific because of the air. As Craig inspects the damage, he's overcome by toxic fumes. He's got to get out. I found this little cinder hill about 100 feet above the helicopter, and I could go there, and the air was almost breathable. It was still horrible, but the wind would blow just right, and I'd get a breath of air. Craig is suffering from hypoxia. The volcanic fumes are filling his lungs and reducing the amount of oxygen getting into his blood supply and this is causing dizziness and nausea. The helicopter electrics are completely dead. No power means no radio, and no radio means no rescue. Eventually what I found was a camera battery. The camera that we were using uses a 24 volt battery, which is the same voltage that the helicopter electrical system uses. With a pocket knife, Craig cuts off the end of the battery cable, then he strips it down to the bare wire. He can only work in short bursts as he has to keep running up to the cinder hill for fresh air. I'd have three or four breaths at a time where I'd get no oxygen at all and it was just gasping. Eventually, Craig manages to wire the battery to the overhead panel and gets power to the radio. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is 
Craig makes repeated mayday calls. Finally, one is picked up by a passing tourist helicopter pilot who alerts the rescue services. Craig scrambles back up the cinder cone to tell Mike and Chris the good news. Chris! I've got a mayday out! They're coming for us! He yells back that he got a mayday out to base camp, and he said, we'll be back in Hilo for dinner. He was coughing and yelling that he couldn't breathe, and he was having a hard time down there. Next thing I hear from Craig is, don't come down here, don't come down here. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I need oxygen. And then we didn't hear anything from him again. I thought that he died. Craig! Craig! The thickening fog and the noise of the volcano has cut off all communications between Craig and his colleagues. But Craig has managed to maintain radio contact with the rescue helicopter. It's impossible for the helicopter to attempt a rescue because of the poor visibility. But the pilot, Don Shearer, helps coordinate a ground rescue team. The rescuers have to work in horrible weather conditions, but they can just make out Craig and the crashed helicopter through the fog. I was able to make verbal as well as visual contact with their lead climber. He felt that he needed to conduct the rescue from where they were, very near the lava flow. We need you to come over here, Craig. We can't go around there. I can't. The air's too bad. And I told him, if I come down to where you are, that it's a one-way trip for me. And it was basically one, two, three, here I come and then I took off towards him. Craig makes a desperate scramble towards the rescuers, but dangerous conditions have forced them to pull back from the crater rim. I looked up to the top and they had disappeared and simply were not there. Craig Hosking has fought his way towards the rescue team into the most suffocating part of the crater, only to find they have withdrawn due to the dangerous conditions. I think by a miracle, I was uh, given the strength to get back to where I could breathe once again. Craig manages to get on the radio to speak to Don Shearer, the pilot coordinating the aborted ground rescue attempt. At that point, I sounded quite weak. He could tell I was dying. He said, Craig, if I get to you, do you have the strength to get on this helicopter? Yeah, yeah, I get it. And Don said, OK, uh, I'm coming. Now, that was the thing where um, uh, Don, um, <coughs> This always happens to me when I talk about Don. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but Don made a life or death decision right then, too. Don, I, Don, I can't breathe. All that Don knew is that I was dying, and, um, and he was willing to go for it. Don now flies his helicopter down into the swirling clouds. He has zero visibility, and there's a real danger of the fog starving his engine of oxygen and causing it to fail. He, too, could end up crashing into the volcano floor. But Mike and Chris can't hear Craig over the helicopter noise. There was a helicopter that 
we could hear that was getting closer and closer and closer, but we couldn't tell because we couldn't see it. Chris, can you see it? Mike! The helicopter's drowning out, Mike and I yelling. Craig returns to the downed helicopter and tries to direct Don towards him on the radio. I think you gotta come north. Don's now flying in visibility of, of maybe five or ten feet. He can barely see the skid of the helicopter as he's picking his way to try and get to me. I then waited, probably at that point, in and out of consciousness. Barely clinging onto life, Craig's only hope is that Don can reach him. Craig makes a desperate bid for safety. I was able to get on the skid, and, and I believe with probably the last ounce of energy I had in this earth, I was able to pull up and get into the backseat of the helicopter. And Don, he was now pretty wide-eyed because he had just gone to the brink of, of his own life. Because he'd had 10 minutes of, the, I would dare say, the worst flying that any pilot has ever had in the, in the history of flying. Mike! Mike! What's going on? For Chris and Mike, it seems like the chopper rescue has been aborted. The helicopter was getting stronger and stronger, then suddenly started to fade and fade until it disappeared, and we, we heard nothing. Late afternoon approaches, and the climate inside the volcano is changing. It's starting to get a little cooler. It's cold. Our throats were constricted, and it was hard to talk. <laughs> Tiny particles of glass fiber, volcanic dust, called Pele's hair, are irritating Mike's eyes and throat. The sulfur in the air mixes with the moisture to form sulfuric acid, and it's burning his skin, throat, and lungs. I, I thought we were going to suffocate if we had to stay in there overnight, but we didn't have a choice. That was probably the last sunset I was ever going to see. Now, desperately thirsty, Mike tries to collect water. I would take my light meter and I'd turn it upside down and I would gather the, the moisture that was coming down. <laughs> it tasted uh, like sulfur and it was just uh, a vile, disgusting taste. As midnight approaches, Chris has given up any hope of ever seeing a rescue team. I was soaking wet, and I was shivering. I wasn't even sure the rock I was sitting on was stable and it was going to hold me all night. Finally, the rescue team returns. It's a crushing blow. Mike and Chris will have to spend a perilous night in the volcano. It was really difficult to breathe. It was really difficult to keep my eyes open for more than a few seconds at a time. So I just kind of made a little tent out of my sweatshirt and just tried to breathe shallow breathing. I would have put our odds at about maybe 20, 30% survival at that point. I'm just thinking to myself, what am I doing here? And I'm running on a lot of adrenaline and uh, I couldn't sleep. In the dark, the volcano seems even more hostile and alive with activity. We could hear landslides all around us. 
any moment we felt like we could just be in an avalanche or just slide off the side of the cliff. I'd feel really confident one minute and then the next minute I would feel like something's not happening here. I was really concerned that Chris was ready to, to jump. Chris! And to just end it all. He thought that there was no way that either one of us was going to get out of here. And the more that we talked, the more I realized that, that he was really seriously thinking about it. It wasn't just a passing moment. Chris! Chris! Mike and Chris have survived a night trapped inside Kilauea, one of the world's most active volcanoes. They are dehydrated and feeling the effects of breathing in toxic fumes. Time is running out, and their only chance of survival is if the rescue team returns soon. I remember when the sun started to come up the next day that there was sort of this renewal of hope that today's the day that we're gonna, something's gonna happen, we're gonna get out of here. We're sitting there and just waiting and waiting and waiting. Suddenly, the rescuers return. They have made it over to their side of the crater and are dropping ropes. More to the left! First one I saw was like about 15 feet away, and I couldn't believe that it was a rope. And then I thought, well, should I try for it, try to dive for it, try to go for it? Now, no, no, it'll probably get closer. The edge of the volcano is extremely unstable, so the rescuers are forced to stay back. They can't see Mike or Chris and can barely hear them. Clinging to a sheer and crumbling cliff face hundreds of feet off the ground, one small slip will spell death for Chris. If I would have jumped for the rope and missed, then it would have been all over for me. And I really thought that they were getting closer each time. Here! To the left! So I thought, you know, maybe the third time it would be right there that we could grab onto the rope. And the third time it came, and it was like six feet away. And I decided, okay, maybe I should die for it. No, wait! 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 Because of the worsening weather above, Mike can no longer be heard nor can he hear the rescuers who are ordered to pull back. The attempted ground rescue is over. With each passing hour, the guy's physical condition is worsening. It's becoming too much to endure. Chris said to me, I can't do it anymore. He said, I can't sit here, I have to leave. I have to try to scale out. And uh, I said, come on, Chris, just stay put. We know that there's rescue people that know where we're at, it's just a matter of time. I had been sitting there for about 28 <laughs> hours at this point and not doing anything but waiting to be rescued. So I just had to do something. I couldn't sit there anymore. I was resigned to the idea that I, I was going to die anyway. So if I died climbing, at least I was doing something. Before I stood up and decided I was going to go, I actually went through and said goodbye to everybody in my family. My sons were like six years old and four. That was really hard for me to sit there and dwell on how would they be without their dad for their whole lives. If I fell off that cliff, you know, there was no chance for survival. All of a 
a sudden, I see this path. It was the weirdest thing. I'm like, where has that been for the last two days? Mike! I'm gonna go for it! Be careful! It was 15, 20 minutes into his climb, and I said, uh, how far are you? And he says, I'm about uh, five feet from the top. And I yelled to him, I said, well, when you get to the top, yell back to me. And he said, yeah, I will, I will, I will. The top, like three feet of the cone, was just a layer of flat gravel, and there was no big chunks to grab onto. At this point, I can't see anything. It's zero visibility. I'm yelling at the top of my lungs, whatever lungs I have left. I can't hear anything, I, uh, no response. I'm up on this cliff, and I thought, oh my god, I made just a horrible mistake. Chris is now stuck on the cliff face. He can't climb up or get down. He's exhausted, and if he falls, he'll face certain death. Three men survive a chopper crash into an active volcano. The pilot has been rescued, but attempts to get the other two out have failed. Now they're hanging onto the crater wall for their lives. Chris Duddy has almost climbed to the top of the crater, but is now stuck on the loose volcanic cinder, unable to pull himself up. I don't know what made me think of this, but I just dug both my arms into this gravel, and it was like sticking your arms into broken glass. I mean, I was just cutting my arms up to get it in there, but I knew I had to get some leverage. So I count to three, and I just did a lunge. And I flipped myself onto the top, onto the lip of the crater, and then just rolled over, and I was, I was out. I realized when I got up there that how bad the weather was, and you couldn't really hear anything. Mike! It seemed like my voice just took a turn. As soon as I yelled down, it didn't go down in there. Mike hears nothing. He has no way of knowing that Chris is still alive. I started to run down the side of the mountain, and I saw the rope there. I remember I picked up the rope, and I'm gonna go get Mike. I'm going to go throw the rope down because I know where he is. So I start running back up the hill with this rope, and then I realize that I'm not strong enough to pull him out right now. I'm in shock. I'm all cut up. I'm in no condition to try to pull Mike out. I'd probably kill both of us trying to do that. So I just laid the rope down, kind of pointing in a, in a line to where he is on the top. I'm standing on the ledge, and all of a sudden, from over my head, comes this brown and black object wailing down through the smoke. And I think that Chris has fallen and plummeted to his death. Now I think that I'm left all by myself. I turned and I started to run down the side of the crater. You know, the smoke was swirling around, and I was hyperventilating, and my adrenaline's flowing, and I wasn't sure where I was going. I was so disoriented because of the smoke swirling around.
He might not know where he is going, but he knows he must get help. The rescuers had left some cones in a trail, so I, I caught onto that. And I came upon their base camp where they had stayed that night. But nobody was there. It was empty. The unpredictable weather has not only stopped the rescue mission, it has forced the team completely off the volcano. I tried to drink water. It, it wouldn't even go down my throat because my throat had, was so swollen. It was almost swollen shut. <laughs> There were oxygen tanks with masks, so I immediately put a mask on, and I just figured I would hike until somebody found me or I'd find the highway or something. Miraculously, Chris is spotted by a helicopter. As soon as they grabbed my arms, my whole body went completely limp. I almost fell over. They had to actually carry me from that point to the helicopter. My body just shut down. Chris tells the rescuers that Mike is still alive, but with the weather closing in again, they cannot attempt a rescue today. Mike Benson is facing a second night in the volcano. Unaware that both of his friends have been rescued, he is convinced that they're dead. I kind of just gave up hope for a while. I just thought that the only peace that I would get would be if I just passed away quietly. I started to see Madame Pele, and it was in profile. It looked like she had long, flowing hair. Hypoxia and dehydration are causing Mike to hallucinate. Signals in his brain are making him believe that he is seeing Madame Pele. Probably around three o'clock in the morning, I felt like that there was nobody supporting me, nobody around. My life was coming to an end. So I took a rock and etched on the side of another rock, uh, this big, huge rock, in fact, uh, you know, I love you, Stephanie. Two men have been rescued after their chopper crashed into a volcano. But after two hellish nights, one man remains. Thinking that his friends are dead, Mike Benson assumes it's only a matter of time before his own life will come to an end. Don Shearer, who made the earlier rescue attempt, is now grounded. The volcano's corrosive gases have damaged his helicopter, so the film company who hired Mike enlists another pilot, Tom Houtman, to attempt another hazardous chopper rescue. All of a sudden, I start to see the tail rotor. I'm still looking up, and then all of a sudden, I start to see the fuselage, and then a head pops out of the left-hand side and it's the pilot, and he has this old beat-up Vietnam helmet on, and he's waving to me, and I'm waving frantically back to him. Benson, don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything dumb. I'll be back at 15. Benson, don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything dumb. Uh, I'll be back in about 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to go get a piece of equipment and come back, and we're going to get you out of here. Once again, rescue seems so close, yet so far. Mike has no idea if the helicopter will return as promised. All previous attempts to reach him have failed. About a half hour goes by and I'm thinking, what's going on? They can't find me or, or are they giving up or what? All of a sudden I hear the helicopter, but this time I can't see anything. The visibility has gone to zero.
helicopter comes in and they were just dropping this net down and just poking it around to where they thought I was. The second time I saw it was like 10 or 12 feet and with that it got lodged on this big huge rock and it got caught up in the net and they thought it was my weight that was in the basket so they powered up and I'm thinking to myself, oh, they're never going to come back. And with that, the net comes back. This time it's like about 10 feet, maybe 9 feet in front of me out in the middle of space. And with that, I just jumped. They felt my weight on it, and they gave full power and took me up. As we were going past the volcano, I remember yelling back to Madame Pele, I won, you lost. It's so hard to describe, to see the people that you love. Then out of the group, I see Craig come walking, and then I realized that they hadn't died. When I came over to greet him, he was pretty dumbfounded and amazed and happy that I was okay. I just couldn't believe that he survived another night in that pit. I was so glad to be alive that I could literally have run a 5K. I had this much adrenaline being pumped into me. Craig Hosking continues to fly helicopters and planes on major feature films and is one of the most in-demand pilots in Hollywood. For a long time, the volcano incident was on my mind a lot. The rescue, the way we did things, and I guess I got to see the core of myself a little bit too. Chris Duddy has risen up through the ranks of the film industry. He is now a director and producer. I don't worry that much about death since the accident, you know? I think you just gotta live your life and things happen. Mike Benson has shot major Hollywood movies. He still loves to fly and now has his own pilot's license. Two other producers have asked if I wanted to go and do some aerial photography over Kilauea. And I said, I don't want to test fate again and be put in a position that uh, I might have to do take two. 